Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Um, today we are going to be introducing and explaining the historical Jesus. Now I want to be clear off the bat, this video is not going to be a full explanation of my understanding of the historical Jesus. Rather, what we're doing today is I'm going to introduce and explain the concept of the historical Jesus. And that is the way that scholars and historians analyze the available evidence to interpret and reconstruct who Jesus of Nazareth was as a historical person apart from Christian and religious ideas about if he was God or if he was divine or if he was the Messiah, etc., etc. What I think of the historical Jesus and how I interpret the information is the subject of my book, which should be coming out sometime in 2020. Um, and, and I'll be doing more videos on it, and I've written about it a little bit here and there. So it's it'll come, it, you know, it's out there. But um, this is going to be an educational video about the topic for people who are new to this, maybe just learning about it and want to want to get a basic rundown. So the starting point for the historical Jesus is the presumption that we cannot trust the Gospels, the four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We cannot trust them or take them at their word to understand who Jesus was, what he said, what he did, etc. The reason we cannot take them at their word is because they were, A, written decades after Jesus' death by people who probably never met him, and B, they were written by people who already believed that Jesus was a very special and unique individual at the very least, and at most, you know, they may have been coming to believe that he was God himself. So they already believed that, so their accounts of his life and his teachings and his deeds are necessarily infused with their theological beliefs about who he was and his importance to their new religion. Basically, they are not unbiased, factual eyewitness accounts. So to understand who Jesus was as a human being, what you do is you first understand what the available evidence is, and then you start to analyze that evidence using a variety of historical critical methods. And just to give some background, the quest of the historical Jesus, as it is called, and that name comes from a book by Albert Schweitzer from 1906, it, it actually began back in the 18th century, late 18th century, when Enlightenment thinkers started to question how trustworthy the gospel accounts in the Christian Bible are, and tried to use kind of the new Enlightenment and rationalist historical methods to understand and explain who Jesus might have been or what he did. Since that first um, initial bout of this, obviously historical critical methods have come a very long way, and there have been a lot of insights and a lot of other discoveries since then. So it's, it's always worth going back and reading Schweitzer's book, at least, because he was an amazing scholar and intellectual. But generally, you're better off reading more recent works, at least works since the 1950s. So our starting point is, what is our available evidence? Now, obviously, most Christians would answer, well, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They'll tell you everything you need to know about Jesus. I've already mentioned a couple problems with that view, but just to elaborate a little bit further, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have a lot of problems. So, for example, only Matthew and Luke say anything about Jesus' birth. And their birth stories, despite how Christians tend to synthesize them together at Christmas time, they are actually completely incompatible with each other, and they don't make any sense together, and they're very different from each other. Now, you can either pretend that it's possible to reconcile them and basically say that they both told their own versions, but somehow both are true. Or you can pick one or the other somewhat arbitrarily. Or you can come to the conclusion that nobody knew much about Jesus's birth, 
and these stories were written to say something else about Jesus. So, for example, Matthew's birth story has Jesus and his family as refugees fleeing into Egypt because King Herod is killing all of the firstborn children, just like what happens in Exodus. So there, Matthew's theological aim is to represent Jesus as, as a mosaic archetype. So he's trying to present Jesus as a new Moses. And you can see this later when Matthew has Jesus deliver the Sermon on the Mount. He comes down from the Mount, just like Moses did, and gives the Sermon, which is really um, an interpretation and instruction on how to follow the Mosaic Law. So it's basically a callback to Moses delivering the law on Mount Sinai. That's just one example of how you can see that these stories were not written intended to be historically accurate and factual and biographical. They were written with a clear theological purpose in mind. Now that said, that doesn't mean that they're useless or that nothing in them is true or that we should just give up on trying to figure out who Jesus really was, what he did, what he said, etc. The Gospels do preserve historical information. It's just a matter of understanding their biases, understanding the differences and contradictions and why they might have arisen, and then looking at other evidence to kind of check yourself on. So, because we cannot trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or take them at their word, what can we trust? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, which means that they are seen together. If you've ever read the Gospels, you've probably noticed that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar to each other in many ways, while John, on the other hand, is totally off in the wilderness doing his own thing. Now, the reason for this is because Mark was actually the first Gospel written. It was written around the year 70, probably a little bit after because it clearly shows knowledge that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, which happened in the year 70. So Mark is the earliest gospel, and it shows clear evidence that whoever wrote it, that's another thing, is that we call these gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they're actually anonymous, and we don't know who really wrote them. If I refer to the authors as Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's only out of convenience. Anyways, Mark shows clear evidence that whoever wrote it was not a native Greek speaker. All of the Gospels and all of the New Testament were written in Greek. But Mark was clearly written by someone for whom Greek was not their mother tongue. Matthew and Luke, however, are written in much better Greek. And they copy much of Mark's narrative word for word, improving it in some places where they feel necessary. Mark is the earliest of the Gospels that appear in the Bible, and then Matthew and Luke were written separately from each other about 20-ish years later. It's impossible to date these things to an exact time, so we give little ranges, or we say circa this year. So first came Mark, and then Matthew and Luke. Now this is important because a lot of Christians or more conservative Bible scholars will say, well, if something appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we know it's historically accurate because we have three accounts, three independent eyewitness accounts of it happening. Now that's not how it works. If something appears in Mark and Matthew and Luke, that probably means we only have one account of it because Mark came first and then Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source. So, one source if something appears in all three Gospels. Mark. Our second major important source is called Q. Q is short for quelle, which was a German word that means source. Now, in the 19th century and into the 20th, a lot of German scholars at first, which is why it's based on a German word, began noticing that Matthew and Luke have a lot of material in common with each other that is not in Mark. The Sermon on the Mount, or Luke's version is called the Sermon on the Plain, is a good example. It has like the Beatitudes in it. That's in Matthew and Luke, but not Mark. Mark. 
the most commonly held explanation is that Matthew and Luke both had another source called Q. We don't have an actual name for it. We have never found it, but we theorize its existence from the material that is common to Matthew and Luke, but absent in Mark. There are alternative hypotheses, of course, but most Bible scholars still believe that Q is most likely by analyzing the Greek text to see what lies beneath it and seeing the ways that Matthew and Luke tell things differently or basically they don't show that much evidence of knowing each other, if any at all. And of course, as with anything involving ancient history and analysis of ancient texts, there's going to be disagreement. But this idea, which is called the two-source hypothesis, Mark and Q are the main sources for the Synoptic Gospels. This is by far the most commonly held position on the matter. And there are even, you know, scholars have gone back to try to do reconstructions of Q by saying, well, this is what it probably looked like in its original form before Matthew and Luke both embedded it within their Gospels. Q was probably a very early sayings gospel, which means that it was a collection of Jesus's sayings without much narrative involved. There was no birth stories, there's no crucifixion stories, it was just a list of his teachings, basically. Now, a lot of people might have been skeptical of this before in the 1950s, uh, we found in a dump in Nag Hammadi in Egypt, um, was discovered a full copy of the Gospel of Thomas, which we had only had fragments of before. Now, the Gospel of Thomas, which is often mistakenly called a Gnostic Gospel, and even though it shows some influence of Gnosticism, it, it's not a Gnostic Gospel. If you actually read it, that's very clear. But anyways, the Gospel of Thomas is also a sayings Gospel. So, we know that these sayings gospels existed at the time. In addition, the author of the Gospel of Luke even says at the beginning that he has used multiple earlier sources when composing his own gospel. So anyways, these are three early sources we have now. Mark and Q, which are the most important because they actually appear in the Bible, and then Thomas, which in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other scholars, actually originates from before Mark, Matthew, or Luke. They think that it probably originated in the 50s of the first century, within a couple decades after Jesus' death, and then was slowly added to over time so that there are later layers of it and earlier layers of it. April de Koenig has done some great work on that and fleshing out some of the layers of it, so I... I Highly recommend her work on it. But anyway, so those are three important sources. And then there are a few other sources. There is a first century document called the Didache, which is a kind of manual of Christian practice for the early Christian community. And it, again, is independent of the Gospels, which means that it didn't know about whoever wrote the Didache did not know about Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And whoever wrote Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not know about the Didache, although it shares some similarities with Matthew and probably originated from the same geographic area. And then we also have the seven authentic letters of Paul. Um, and I'm going to put them on the screen right here so you can see which letters Paul actually wrote. There are, I think, 13 attributed to him in the New Testament, but he only actually wrote seven of them by the opinion of a majority of scholars. Paul mentions a few incidental details about Jesus' life. He uh, was not trying to write about Jesus' life. That wasn't very much a concern to him, but he does mention a few details. And then we have a couple of non-Christian sources, the most important of which was a Jewish Roman historian named Flavius Josephus, who was wealthy and friends with the Roman emperor and betrayed the Jewish people during the Roman-Jewish War in the 60s, and definitely, most assuredly, was not a Christian. So he wrote a little bit about Jesus in Book 18 of his work, The Antiquities of the Jews, and this little paragraph about Jesus was tampered with by later Christian scribes, 
So it's hard to trust, but most scholars think that they have an authentic core of it that goes back to Josephus's original writing. So the reason I'm talking about sources is because, and there are some differences about how to do this. You'll find conservative scholars that place less of an emphasis on this, and then you'll find also some postmodern scholars who place less of an emphasis on this. But in my opinion, and as you all know, I'm a Marxist, so historical materialism is my primary lens for understanding history. In my opinion, the most important way of starting to analyze the historical Jesus is by seeing if there's more than one independent source that has that story in it. So, for example, if Mark's gospel says something about Jesus, and then Paul also mentions that same thing about Jesus. Now, Paul was writing before Mark, and Mark probably didn't have the letters of Paul in front of him when he wrote. If they both agree on this, then it means that neither Paul nor Mark could have made it up themselves. It doesn't guarantee that Jesus actually said or did it, but it does make it much more likely that it's something that Jesus may have said. And then, of course, if you have three sources or four independent sources, the likelihood increases and increases. Now, there is a kind of very mechanistic way of reconstructing the historical Jesus, and it has kind of fallen out of favor lately, which is probably a good thing. But so the, the, the traditional way of doing this that was predominant in the second half of the 20th century was dividing up the synoptic gospels into units of text called pericopes. Now this can be as short as a single sentence that Jesus is supposed to have said, or it can be as long as an entire narrative. Basically what it is, it is a unit of text or story, a parable, a teaching, a story of Jesus coming into conflict with someone, and the authors of the Gospels felt free to take these pericopes and move them around and change elements of them to fit their theological purposes or put them in a place where they thought would be more thematically appropriate. They're basically independent units of material. And then each pericope was tested under a certain number of criteria. Now, these were called the criteria of authenticity. There is a list of them. And basically, you would test each individual pericope under several or as many of these criteria of authenticity as you could. And if it passed, you know, enough of them, then you could say, well, it's something the historical Jesus probably said or did. I'm going to list some of these criteria just so you can get um, an understanding of what we're dealing with here. And I'm going to explain, you know, if I find them legitimate or if they're problematic, because some of them are very problematic. The most important criteria, which I've already talked about, is the criterion of multiple independent attestation. And this one is the most important one by far. If a saying of Jesus or a deed of Jesus or a teaching of Jesus or a, a detail about Jesus if multiple sources have it independently of each other, then neither of them or none of them could have made it up themselves, and it is more likely to go back to the historical Jesus. Again, it doesn't guarantee it, but it gives you a good starting point. So next is, and this was a very common one throughout much of the 20th century, they call it the criterion of dissimilarity or double dissimilarity. And basically the idea is, if a saying of Jesus is dissimilar, meaning it is not similar to either the mainstream Jewish ideas at the time of Jesus or to the early Christian community after the death of Jesus, then it's more likely historical. This criterion is mostly bullshit. It presumes without evidence that Jesus was somehow different from the common Judaism of his time. Now, of course, a lot of Christians take this for granted because they think Jesus came to institute a new covenant or whatever, but there is actually no historical evidence for that whatsoever. Remember, we are not basing our reconstruction of Jesus on Christian faith or Christian teachings or anything that came after the death of Jesus. We are trying to understand Jesus in his own time, 
based on the actual evidence. So unless you can demonstrate with actual evidence that Jesus was somehow radically different from Second Temple Judaism, and that's the form of Judaism that he lived under, the kind of era or epoch of Judaism, unless you can demonstrate that based on evidence, then it's very specious at best to say that because a saying attributed to Jesus is different from what other Jews at the time believed, then it must be historical. So the criterion of dissimilarity is not a good one and not one that has, uh, it, it has fallen out of favor and rightfully so. A better one is called the criterion of embarrassment. Now this one holds that if something attributed to Jesus or something about Jesus would have been embarrassing or difficult for the early Christian community, it's more likely to be historical because they would not have made it up because making it up or having it in the canon presented problems for them. So why would they make something up that presented problems for them? Now this one, of course, is not conclusive by itself, but it's better than the criterion of dissimilarity. Um, a good example is the crucifixion. And this is one where a lot of like new atheists or people who deny that there even was a historical Jesus will say, well, we can't possibly know what would have been embarrassing to them. I've seen them use that argument, but this is not actually true. We do know what was embarrassing to them because they wrote about it and talked about it. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians, I think in the first chapter, Paul talks about how Gentiles and the non-Christian Jews saw the proclamation of a crucified Messiah as foolishness and a stumbling block. So that was clearly embarrassing to them. And then Justin Martyr in the second century even says that non-Christians viewed the belief in a crucified Messiah as madness or insanity. If this is the case, if the people who they wanted to convert saw them proclaiming a crucified Messiah as foolishness and insanity and a stumbling block, why would they make it up? Why would they invent that story? So... From that, we can surmise that the crucifixion of Jesus is probably true. He almost certainly was crucified. And indeed, the fact of his crucifixion is one of the details about him that we can be most sure about. It, it is pretty much incontrovertible because we have actual crucifixion narratives. And, and, they, and this is only in one source because it comes from Mark, the whole narrative of the Passion but then we also have Josephus, writing at the end of the first century, mentions that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and he was a non-Christian. So the, uh, the fact of Jesus' crucifixion, you can pretty much take to the bank. So from there, you can kind of start building your case. You know, we have a few criteria, and we have the evidence, we have an understanding of the evidence, and then you start to build off of that. So we can say, okay, Jesus was crucified. What do we know about crucifixion? And this is where we start turning to secondary sources. We learn that the Romans used crucifixion mostly to punish political rebels and bandits and insurgents and people who got funny ideas about changing the status quo of Roman imperialism in Palestine. So we can say, all right, well, when we're going to test more of Jesus' sayings, we can look for anything in his teachings or deeds that might have pissed off the Romans. Those are now more likely to be historically true because we know that Jesus pissed off the Romans. He wouldn't have been crucified if he didn't piss off the Romans. So now we have another secondary criterion that we can use to analyze his sayings and deeds. Another criterion that is often used is uh, Semitism or Aramaism. And it's basically so... If there's a saying that makes more sense in Aramaic than in Greek, then that shows that it was probably translated from Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus and his earliest followers spoke, which means that it at least goes back to the very early Christian community before it became Greek-speaking and Gentile. Again, it's not conclusive by itself because it could have come from one of Jesus' earliest followers who spoke Aramaic, not necessarily from Jesus. So the point is that you use all these criteria together 
to analyze the different pericopes and see, well, if it satisfies multiple criteria, then you're on safer ground if you say that it's historical. Now, there's been some pushback in recent years about the kind of overly mechanical and mechanistic way that these criterion are applied. So you'll have scholars or groups of scholars kind of just list the pericopes and list which criteria they satisfy and then just declare a saying authentic or non-authentic based. It's, it turns into a number crunching game. It's that you satisfy three different criteria. Okay, you're historical. You only satisfy one criteria. Okay, not historical. And this is problematic because it, it, it misses the forest for the trees. What we have are documents written by people mostly to glorify and exalt Jesus. They're trying to condense an entire ministry and set of teachings and life of a real living, breathing human being into what essentially amounts to a short story and collection of teachings that they felt free to rearrange, add to, take away from, and they all had their own agendas in doing so. So for example, Luke was probably a Gentile and probably wanted to make it seem as if Jesus was more open to Gentiles and Greeks than he really was. Matthew, on the other hand, was very Jewish and very apocalyptic. He probably had an agenda to make Jesus seem more apocalyptic than he really was. So reading these things and analyzing every single saying or deed of Jesus based on a list of criteria is a good place to start, but you also have to go and consider the larger historical context. You have to check it then against what we know from archaeology, from other documents, from beliefs in Judaism, from anthropology, the cultural and historical context of Roman imperialism and the Jewish religion. You look at other Jewish sects from around the time of Jesus, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and information about John the Baptist. You analyze the Greek and the Aramaic and the Hebrew to kind of see what these words might have meant in that time period. Because reading them today in an English translation, even in a very good English translation, you're not going to get the same meaning that you would have if you had lived back then and spoken that language. You look at how the early Christian church developed, and you try to trace the trajectory of certain teachings or sayings or practices. And obviously, I am also a Marxist, and I subscribe to historical materialism, which is the idea that history is moved forward by class struggle. So you also add in the class struggle elements to reconstructing the historical Jesus. And this is an area where I feel that most bourgeois scholars of the historical Jesus read all of them, where they miss the mark, because they fail to adequately take into account the class system of the Roman Empire and first century Palestine. They don't talk about the ways in which Jesus's life was shaped by class struggle and the way he saw class and the material reality of the society he lived in and the inequalities, etc., etc. And what it all adds up to is a highly individualized and personal reconstruction of the historical Jesus. You will never find two Jesus scholars who agree 100% about everything. It just doesn't happen. Everyone who's engaged in this type of work will come to necessarily slightly different conclusions or sometimes even radically different conclusions. Or they will just choose to emphasize different aspects. Some will want to emphasize Jesus' eschatological message. Some will want to emphasize his ethical teachings. Some will want to emphasize his teachings about the Torah and Judaism. None of these can ever hope to fully realize and fully understand who Jesus was as a person. No ancient person from 2000 or more or even less years ago is fully reachable by these types of methods. The reality is that unless somebody invents a time machine to go back and talk to the real Jesus, it's the best we can do. We can pick out the sayings and stories and deeds that we can be most sure of, and we can use them 
to understand some of what Jesus believed and taught and did. Now, the search for the historical Jesus by using these methods that I've laid out is disturbing and offensive even to some Christians. A lot of Christians are taught to believe that the Gospels and the whole Bible is inerrant, that it is all literally true, that it is inspired by God, that if Jesus said something, then you might as well take it as law, unless it has to do with helping the poor or, you know, anything communistic like that, of which there's a lot. They, they tend to ignore those. But the bigger picture is that the idea of picking apart the Gospels and completely ignoring the Gospel of John because it was written way later and has very little to do with the historical Jesus, the idea that you can kind of take everything apart this way and reconstruct this bare-bones picture of a historical Jesus who didn't preach about being God, who didn't preach about forgiving people from original sin or anything like that, you might think that it's calling into question the core tenets of Christianity itself. And obviously, I don't believe that. I believe that starting with the historical Jesus is the best and indeed the only way to start reconstructing our Christian faith the way that Jesus originally meant it to be. If we're Christians, if following Jesus is our purpose in our religion, then starting with who he was as a real historical person can only help us get closer to his authentic teachings. Thank you. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's just a very basic introduction, and I am going to make another video in the near future talking um, more about this subject and getting deeper into it, starting with the Gospel of Q and how we know you know, that the Q gospel exists and, and some of the methodologies we use to determine that. So this is definitely just an introduction and there will be more on the way. Thank you so much for watching. Um, hit subscribe if this has been helpful to you because there's, I definitely want to make more and get deeper into this.